Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Glasgow Times Sports Podcast, normally recorded in our studio at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre, currently recorded from our volunteers' homes. To keep in touch with us, use our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, which are all at Q and Review. That's C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. Or get in touch via information at qandreview.com. That's information at C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W.com. Please like and share our podcast and give us any constructive feedback. Evening Time Sport, February 22. Martin O'Neill praises Postecoglou for sticking to his guns. Report by Anthony Brown. Martin O'Neill believes Celtic boss Ange Postecoglou is now reaping the rewards for sticking to his guns during a testing start to his Parkhead reign. After replacing Neil Lennon last summer, the Australian oversaw mixed results as he tried to put together a new team and implement his philosophy. The manager's expansive playing style was widely questioned after a defeat at Livingston in September left Celtic in mid-table. But after trailing Rangers by six points at the end of 2021, Postecoglou's team have now added consistency and soared three points clear of the city rivals in the Singe Premiership. Very good indeed, excellent, former Hoops manager O'Neill told the PA news agency when asked about the progress made by the Australian. From a stodgy start domestically, it's been really good. Looking in from a distance, it seemed a big rebuild was required. It was important that some of the good players stayed on, like Callum McGregor, and some of the players he has brought in have done wonderfully well. Sticking to your beliefs as a manager is important. That's where Ange gains a great deal of respect from me, because he stuck with it and believed in it. At the start, when results weren't really there, you start to think maybe he needs to go with a different emphasis or a change of direction. But no, he stuck to his beliefs and it is bearing fruit domestically. It can be very difficult to do that when results are not going so well. So well done to Ange. Celtic tightened their grip on top spot when they eked out a 3-2 win at home to Dundee a few hours after Rangers had drawn at Dundee United. O'Neill insists his old club will still face a stern test from a Rangers side who issued a reminder of their capabilities by winning 4-2 away to Borussia Dortmund in the Europa League last week. Said O'Neill, it was a big win for Celtic on Sunday after Rangers could not get the win against Dundee United. There's a long way to go, but they've got the three-point lead and the better goal difference. I'm quite sure Rangers will not give it up easily. Having done so brilliantly against Dortmund, they will still feel as if they've got a real chance. O'Neill was promoting the return of the Masters football tournament this summer after an 11-year absence. The newly launched 360 Sports TV Masters Cup will be staged at Glasgow's Brayhead Arena on July 8 and will include former players aged 35 or over from Premier League giants Liverpool and Manchester United as well as Celtic and Rangers. O'Neill will be managing the hoop side in a tournament that will be beamed by 360 Sports TV. He said, I can't wait for it to come back to Glasgow, where I have many happy memories and many friends. It's great that the fans will be able to watch 
such an iconic tournament once again, with such fabulous football heritage. It should be a really fantastic evening. Report by Anthony Brown Evening Times Sport, February 22 Nick Roger says Saudi Super Golf League dead in the water for now. Well, that's it then. By all accounts, the Saudi bankrolled Super Golf League now has about as much chance of getting off the ground as one of Heath Robinson's elaborate steam-driven winch and pulley absurdities. Amid all the talk, the cloak and dagger dealings, the hush-hush of NDAs and the nod and a wink innuendo, one of the best things about this prolonged rigmarole was John Ram's use of the word fealty the other day as the world number one aligned himself with the PGA Tour in a robust show of loyalty which was mirrored by a parade of other stars over a weekend of significant twists and turns in this saudi fueled saga. I am sure it's the first time fealty has made a headline since Harold's oath to William of Normandy on some sacred relics was stitched into the bayou tapestry. While Ram's utterance had golf writers thumbing through the thesaurus, Phil Mickelson's startling comments about the Saudi paymasters he was willing to loop into bed with were a trifle less erudite. They're scary motherfuckers to get involved with, he said in a series of jaw-dropping excerpts which were released over the weekend from an upcoming biography by the writer Alan Shipnock. The contents of the material also exposed how Mickelson hoped to leverage the threat of a breakaway Super League against the high Hegians at the PGA Tour. Mickelson explained, We know they killed journalist Jamal Khashoggi and have a horrible record on human rights. They execute people over there for being gay. Knowing all of this, why would I even consider it? Because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to reshape how the PGA Tour operates. I'm not sure I even want the Super League to succeed, but just the idea of it is allowing us to get things done with the PGA Tour. It was eyebrow-raising stuff as Mickelson's moral compass went haywire. Given the impact his musings had, they probably should have been accompanied by a red alert from the Met Office. Then again, Perhaps the four-minute warning would have been more appropriate as a series of nuclear bombs fell on the Super League scheme. Not for the first time in his career. Remember his merciless public filleting of Tom Watson in the grisly aftermath of the 2014 Ryder Cup. Mickelson came across as a heartless opportunist fueled by selfish desires. Rory McElroy certainly didn't hold back with a withering assessment of the six-time major winner and his cynical flirtation with the Saudi riches. Naive, selfish, egotistical, ignorant, said McElroy of the 51-year-old. Ouch! For the last couple of years, the Saudis have been like some seductive siren warbling on a rocky outcrop in an attempt to lure the world's best players into their money-soaked embrace. Golf's ordered normality has had to navigate the kind of choppy waters you'd hear about on the shipping forecast, but now, according to McElroy, the whole Super League idea is dead in the water. McElroy nailed his colours to the mast immediately when the idea was first floated in 2020 
and delivered a resounding Harvey Smith salute to the Saudis. Tiger Woods, crucially, was never on side either. It was left to Big Phil to be some kind of Pied Piper figure, but there's a danger now that he's become more of a pariah. Despite rumours that up to 20 leading lights were ready for an imminent walkout from the established tours, the opposite happened over the weekend. After the likes of Ram and Colin Morikawa had sworn firm allegiance to the PGA Tour, statements of support released on Sunday by Dustin Johnson and a slightly begrudging Bryson DeChambeau two players seen as potential defectors, fortified this united front and bolstered the status quo. Despite this noble victory, golf's tours can't rest on their laurels. One can't imagine the Saudis with their limitless wealth, ambition and now severely dented pride will simply disappear into the night. Their expansion of the Asian tour, for instance, remains an intriguing subplot in golf's power struggle. Where all of this leaves Mickelson is anybody's guess. If he's not biting the hand that feeds him, he lambasted the PGA Tour the other week for obnoxious greed. Then he's burning various bridges and boats with the Saudis. On both sides, he must be about as popular as that human emission in the spacesuit that Billy Connolly used to joke about. Mickelson has always courted risk and reward throughout his playing career. The bold, daring recovery shot, for instance, remains one of his hallmarks. Salvaging his reputation from the debris of this Saudi stushy, however, may require a bit more than a bravely executed lob wedge. And another thing. Amid all the largely unedifying talk of obscenely rich golfers mulling over more obscene riches, it's important to remember the good news stories. Yesterday, the DP World Tour reinforced its commitment to disabled golf with the launch of the, four G, of the G4D Golf for the Disabled Tour, which will see an increased number of events held at the same time as some of the regular circuit's biggest tournaments. One of the lazy, cliched assumptions about golf is that it's riddled with exclusivity when in fact it's one of the most inclusive sports of all. Disabled golf underlines that, says Nick Roger. Evening Time Sport, February 22. St Mirren confirm Stephen Robinson as their new manager. Report by Aidan Smith. St Mirren have confirmed Stephen Robinson as their new manager. The former Motherwell boss has agreed a two and a half year deal with the club joining from English League One Morecambe. Robinson will be joined by Morecambe first team coach Dermot O'Carroll, who becomes his assistant manager. On his appointment, Robinson said, it's an absolute honour that St Mirren have come in and were willing to pay the compensation. It came out of the blue, and when I spoke to the guys at the club, it really impressed me what they are trying to do. We spoke in depth about where we can take the club and there's real exciting times ahead. With the foundations that have already been built by Jim Goodwin, it's up to me to take them on and build on what's already been done. St Mirren Chief Executive Tony Fitzpatrick continued, We are all delighted to welcome Stephen as the new manager of St Mirren. He fits the profile of what we are looking for in a manager. He has great experience of the Scottish game and had good success on the part with Motherwell, which saw him reach the finals of both the League and Scottish Cups, as well as a third place finish and qualification for the Europa League. 
Stephen also did a tremendous job of developing young players at Motherwell, which was an important consideration for us with the St Mirren Youth Academy, one of the main pillars of our football club. We would like to thank Morecambe for their cooperation in getting this deal completed. St Mirren Chairman John Needham added, We are excited to name Stephen as our new manager. At such a vital stage of the season, it was crucial that we move quickly to get the best candidate in place, and we are thrilled to welcome Stephen to the club. The Board of Directors must give great credit to Tony Fitzpatrick, who ensured that there were a number of great options for us to consider following Jim Goodwin's departure. Report by Aidan Smith Evening Times Sport February 23 Darius Azamzouk on the Rangers player who can prevent a repeat of the Borussia collapse of 1999 Report by Mary Theo Lindsay Darius Adamzuk has expressed confidence Rangers can avoid the agonising fate they suffered on the last occasion they held a two-goal lead over Borussia Dortmund in a European doubleheader thanks to the involvement of one player, Evergreen Alan McGregor. Giovanni van Bronckhorst's side recorded a famous result in Germany last week when he defeated Marco Rose's team 4-2 in the first leg of the Europa League knockout round playoff. Hopes are high among followers of the Premiership champions that they can complete an aggregate victory over their Bundesliga opponents at Ibrox tomorrow evening and book a place in the last 16 of the competition. However, Dutch manager Van Bronckhorst will be acutely aware that nothing can be taken for granted, having been, along with his Polish teammate Adam Suk, a member of a Rangers side that suffered an ignominious collapse against Dortmund back in 1999. A Jurgen Kohler own goal and a Rod Wallace strike in the first leg of a UEFA Cup third round tie that was played in front of 49,268 fans in Govan, put Dick Advocat's men in a commanding position. But in the rematch, Victor Epica pulled one back for the hosts, who had won the Champions League two years earlier in the first half, and then Freddy Bobic forced extra time when he netted in the second minute of injury time. The game went to penalties and Dortmund goalkeeper Jens Lehmann saved spot kicks from Van Bronckhorst, Arthur Newman and Claudia Reyna to ensure his men won the shootout 3-1 and went through. The memory of that excruciating reverse is still painful for Adam Suk, the industrious defender come midfielder who was involved in both games. He said, We were very unlucky in the Champions League that season. We lost to Bayern Munich 1-0 in Germany in our final group game and just missed out on the knockout rounds. Our striker Michael Moles suffered a bad injury in the first half in the Olympic Stadium and we went out of that competition and dropped into the UEFA Cup in the first leg against Dortmund, we played well and won 2-0, but in the second game, we lost a goal in the 92nd minute. Their goalkeeper went up for a corner, won the ball, and they scored an equaliser. I went off after full time and was replaced. Unfortunately, Giovanni, Arthur and Claudia all missed their penalty kicks. I can still remember the feeling in the dressing room afterwards. Everybody was bitterly disappointed. It was a very sad place. We had led 2-0 after the first leg and had only gone out because we had lost a goal in the 92nd minute. 
everything that could have gone against us in that game did go against us. If we had lost 3 nothing in regulation time and gone out, it wouldn't have been easy to take, but it certainly wouldn't have felt as bad. Adam Sick can recall how Advocate was forced to draft in Thomas Meyer from Everton to play in those matches after Lionel Charbonnier and Stephen Kloss were both ruled out by injuries. The 52-year-old, who is now sporting director at Extract Clasa High Flyers, Pogon Sezezen, in his homeland, felt that Norwegian internationalist Meyer performed admirably in difficult circumstances and was in no way responsible for the exit. However, he is hopeful that having an experienced and proven European performer like McGregor between the sticks tomorrow night will enable Rangers to protect their lead and progress. He said, Stefan Kloss got injured and Thomas Meyer came in. It was difficult for us to go into these games without our first choice keeper. Having said that, Thomas was a good player as well and did a good job. But I think it is very important for Rangers to have an experienced goalkeeper like McGregor when they play in Europe. He has been involved in big games like this on many occasions in the past and what is more, has played well in them. Dortmund need to score goals, so they will throw everything at Rangers. It is good for the whole Rangers team, and the defence in particular, to know that they have a player like McGregor behind them. It makes the team feel more comfortable, and that is a good thing when you are under pressure. Adamsuk confessed, he is astonished that McGregor, who is Rangers' first choice keeper despite turning 40 last month, is still playing, as he trained with him during his own three-year stint at Ibrox between 1999 and 2002. He said, He is an old guy like me now. I can remember him from when I played for Rangers. He started training with the first team when I was there. He was only 18 or 19. I am a little bit surprised that he is still there and still playing, because it is 20 years since I left. I can't believe an old teammate of mine is still there, but it is great to see. He deserves to be playing, because he is an excellent goalkeeper and has only got better with age. Adam Suk, who helped Rangers to beat Parma of Italy, 2-1 on aggregate to reach the Champions League group stages at the start of the 1999-2000 campaign, still follows the fortunes of his old club and has enjoyed seeing them do well in Europe once again in the last few seasons. He is keeping his fingers crossed that the Scottish champions can prevail against Dortmund at Ibrox tomorrow night and go through but he knows from personal experience that there is no guarantee they will try him. He said, It is 50-50. Rangers have done very, very well in Europe in the last few years. I watched them a lot in Europe when Stephen Gerrard was in charge and was always impressed. The experience they have gained will be invaluable to them in this match. Dortmund are not as strong as they were before, but they are normally very solid. They won 6 nothing at the weekend, and I think they will play far better, but Rangers have a chance. Report by Matthew Lindsay Evening Times Sport, February 23 Missed chances come back to haunt Thistle as Morton grab late winner. Report by James Kearney Greenock Morton snatched a late winner at Firhill as Wazen McEntee grabbed his first senior goal 
to lift his side to sixth in the championship. Patrick Thistle had more of the ball and enough chances to put the game to bed, but failed to make them count and were made to pay with just 10 minutes left to play. We are disappointed with the way the game finished, said Thistle assistant Neil Scally, who was filling in for Ian McCall after the Firhill boss picked up a one-match suspension after accruing four bookings. For vast periods of the game, I thought we controlled it and had a lot of good opportunities that we never took. We were not as clinical as I would have liked. The worst we should be looking to come out that game with is a draw. Again, we've just not been clinical enough when it mattered. The home side could have taken the lead with less than two minutes on the clock when a well-worked move saw the ball work to Ross Doherty to the right of the Morton box. The Thistle skipper's shot was parried by Jack Hamilton, who showed good reactions to deny Alex Jacobiak's follow-up effort from close range. The surface at Firhill was not exactly conducive to free-flowing football, but the Jags had the upper hand during the opening 45 minutes. Brian Graham went close when he rippled the side netting with a powerful strike from distance, and Jaku Biak was presented with a fine opportunity moments later as he burst free of the visitors' defence but could not provide the finish. Thistle were playing well in spells, but were lacking that all-important killer touch in the final third. A drilled Cammy Smith ball across the face of goal was begging to be turned in, but no one was there to prod the ball home. Graham looked to have sprung clear of the Morton backline for a one-on-one -on -one a few minutes later, only to be denied by the linesman's flag. Kevin Holt and Doherty went close from corner kicks as Thistle turned the screw, but they were fortunate not to give away a penalty on the stroke of half-time. A driven shot from Cameron Blues appeared to strike the arm of Tunji Akinola in the host's box, but referee Ewan Anderson waved play on. The Jags came flying out of the traps for the second half as they peppered the Morton goal and asked some serious questions of the defence. It looked for all the world like Graham would nod his team in front when a cross was floated towards the big centre forward lurking at the back post, but he was denied by the frame of the goal from a few yards out. Thistle had the ball in the net shortly before the hour mark, but it wouldn't count. A corner from the home side was whipped in, and the ball appeared to strike the arm of a Morton defender as the referee pointed to the spot. Graham's initial penalty was saved by Hamilton. The striker's diving header followed up, struck the inside of the post, and rebounded out to Holt. The left back swept it home, but was adjudged to have brought down his man while he was at it as Anderson invoked the fury of the Firhill faithful by awarding a free kick to Morton. Gozi Yugu was fortunate to escape with just a booking when the striker reacted angrily to a tussle with Tunji Akinola as the tempo dropped. Morton looked happy to settle for the point as they relied on their shape to keep their opponents at bay and it was working. Thistle had plenty of the ball, but there was little in the way of incision. Then, with ten minutes left to play, Dougie Imrie's men snatched all three. A Morton free kick from deep fell to the feet of McEntee at the back post as the Thistle defence switched off. The defender took a touch, turned inside and hacked the ball home from six yards to score his first goal for the Greenock club and lift them into six. 
I won't lie, it was a bit nervy at times as Patty Thistle put us under a lot of pressure for long periods and they'll be a bit gutted considering they missed their penalty, said Morton boss Dougie Imrie, who was also serving a touchline ban. I thought that after the penalty miss, the reaction from the boys was brilliant. We got ourselves back into the game, and then it was a great finish to go on and win it for us inside the last 10 minutes, added Imrie. Report by James Kearney Evening Time Sport, February 23 West Ham Ace hoping to draw Rangers in Europa League Report by Ewan Payton West Ham star Thomas Suzek admits he would love to face Rangers in the last 16 of the Europa League the Czech Republic midfielder would relish the chance to take part in a battle of Britain with the Scottish champions should they reach the next knockout round of the tournament. The Hammers are already in Friday's draw, having finished top of their group prior to Christmas. David Moy's men are waiting to see who their next opponents will be once the last 32 ties are concluded. Rangers hope to be a part of the Friday's draw and they are in pole position to qualify as they lead Borussia Dortmund 4-2 going into the return leg. And Susek would love to draw Giovanni van Bronckhorst's men. He told the West Ham website, I've thought about a few teams I would like to play against and if I could say one, it would be Rangers because I want to play against them as a big rival. It could be a really good game for teams from England against Scotland, big rivals. It would be a really exciting game for the fans and also for us. This team could be good, but everyone we could draw at this stage of the competition will be difficult to face because they have had to win many games to go through. Let's see. I look forward to it. I'm looking forward to the draw because I've been watching the games in the round before us. Teams still have their second legs on Thursday, so I'll watch them and also I will watch the draw if it's possible. Report by Ewan Payton Evening Time Sport, February 24 Stuart Bannigan left frustrated by defeat Report by James Kearney Stuart Bannigan insists that Patty Thistle had more than enough chances to see off Morton at Firhill on Tuesday night as the Jags stalwart admitted his frustration at his side's inability to see off their opponents. Ian McCall's men saw plenty of the ball and created a few clear-cut chances but failed to put the ball in the net and a late goal via a set piece secured a smash and grab win for the Greenock side. Thistle knew that if they won all their games in hand, then they would shoot to the top of the championship standings, but fell at the first hurdle against Dougie Imrie's men. Naturally, Bannigan is disappointed with the result, but the midfielder, who made his 300th appearance for the Maryhill club against Morton, believes that if Thistle played the way they did on Tuesday night for the remainder of the season, more often than not the result will fall their way. Said Bannigan, I thought we dominated the game and had so many chances. Morton did not offer anything, to be honest with you. They scored with their only chance in the box, and on another night we win that game no problem. It just wasn't to be. It is disappointing, because it was a game in hand. We were the only game on in the league, and it was a chance to put a statement out there, so it was frustrating. But the performance was there. We just couldn't score. The manager said to us after the game that if we keep playing that like that between now and the end of the season, that we won't be far away. 
Brian Graham scuppered Thistle's greatest chance of the night when his penalty was saved by Morton goalkeeper Jamie Hamilton. The striker's follow-up header struck the inside of the post and was eventually scrambled home by Kevin Holt, only for the referee to chalk the goal off for an apparent foul on Hamilton. It wasn't the first time this season that Graham has missed a spot kick, but Bannigan backed the Diet's top scorer to rediscover his composure from 12 yards and for the team to bounce back against Wraith Rovers at Starks Park on Saturday. He was unlucky, Bannigan said of Graham's miss. These things happen. We had enough chances throughout the game to win it. He is an experienced pro and he will bounce back quickly, I'm pretty sure about that, and he'll step up and take the next one. It is about a reaction now. It is so important now against Wraith, and we want to try and get the result. We need to turn it around and start being a bit more clinical. They couldn't get out of their own half for most of the game because we had them camped in, but they took their chance, and we didn't. Report by James Kearney Evening Times Sport, February 24 Golf's greatest showman, Phil Mickelson, counts cost of wildest act. Report by Nick Roger Talk about beating a hasty retreat. With all the finesse of a man reversing his car into the entire peloton of the Tour de France, Phil Mickelson has backed away from golf amid great hubris and humiliation. Unless you've been cocooned in a bathyspear for the last few days, you'll have no doubt noticed that Mickelson was responsible for a series of comments about the proposed Saudi Super League that had the same explosive impact as a major malfunction at a munitions factory. To briefly recap, Mickelson described the Saudis he was plotting with to disrupt golf status quo as scary motherfuckers and brazenly stated that he was happy to turn a blind eye to the kingdom's grotesque human rights record if it meant it would give him more power to push for change in the dictatorship of the PGA Tour. It was hard to avoid the mercenary motives of an extremely rich man seeking to squeeze more millions out of whatever golden goose he could manipulate. His incendiary quotes were part of an interview he gave to the golf writer Alan Shipnuck, yet in a subsequent and grovelling apology in which he appeared to anoint himself as some kind of martyr for the betterment of golf, Mickelson turned to that tried, trusted, yet ultimately limp excuse that his words were off the record and taken out of context. What context we're supposed to take the scary mother what do you call thems in is anybody's guess. The writer in question, meanwhile, launched a swift counter-offensive as affairs began to unravel. Not once in our texts or when we got on the phone did Mickelson request to go off the record and I never consented to it, wrote Shipnock on the Fire Pit Collective website. Mickelson simply called me up and opened a vein. To claim now that the comments were off the record is false and duplicious. If the backlash from his original comments was fierce, he was branded selfish, egotistical and ignorant by Rory McElroy. The release of his apology did little to douse the flames. One of Mickelson's longest standing sponsors, KPMG, swiftly announced a mutual termination of the relationship. It's a plummet from grace that would make Icarus wince. Like some meandering mea culpa, you'd hear from someone caught at a clandestine Downing Street cheese and wine shindig. Mickelson's display of contrition was from the mouth, 
or at least the keyboards of his damage limitations PR task force of a man who had been rumbled. The apology didn't actually feature an apology to the PGA Tour, the circuit he has made upwards of £70 million from playing earnings alone. Instead, there was far more remorse reserved for LIV Golf Investments, the company fronted by Greg Norman, backed by the Saudi Public Investment Fund and tasked with steamrolling and bankrolling this new device of golfing got dawn. Mickelson wrote, My experience with LIV Golf Investments has been very positive. I apologise for anything I said that was taken out of context. The specific people I have worked with are visionaries and have only been supportive. More importantly, they love golf and share my drive to make the game better. From scary mother bleeps to visionaries was quite the leap. Mickelson has not played, funnily enough, since the Saudi International at the start of February. During that event, he lambasted the PGA Tour for obnoxious greed, while simultaneously shoving a vast appearance fee from the Saudis into his suitcase. Goodness knows where or when he will appear next. The 51-year-old, who became the oldest winner of a major at last season's United States PGA Championship, announced that he will be taking time away from the game to prioritise the ones I love most and work on being the man I want to be. He also confessed that the pressures, stresses and burdens of a sporting life in the spotlight is now slowly affecting me at a deeper level. Nobody will take pleasure in his admission of these deeper issues, whatever they may be. Sympathy is hardly rampant though for man who, not so long ago, seemed to be at the vanguard of an imminent twenty-strong splinter group, but now stands alone as other potential defectors swiftly deserted him. You could argue that all those big names who signed NDAs and have been silently complicit in this failed insurrection of the PGA Tour can hardly walk away with heads held high. Mickelson, as he was quick to tell us in his self-serving communication, was happy to take the hits publicly to do the work behind the scenes. The hits he has taken in the last few days have been considerable. As golf's upper echelon closes ranks, one of the game's great showmen is left counting the cost of his wildest act yet, says Nick Roger. Evening Times Sport, February 24 Former Celtic striker Sutton brands Liverpool great Michael Owen a caveman. Report by James Kearney Former Celtic striker Chris Sutton has called Liverpool great Michael Owen a caveman as the pair debated concussion protocols in football. Appearing on BT Sports coverage of the Champions League knockout tie between Ajax and Benfica, the pair both reacted when centre-half Lisandro Martinez sustained a head knock. The Argentine defender received some treatment and went on to play the full 90 minutes, leaving Sutton, a passionate campaigner for player safety in relation to head knocks, feeling frustrated. Sutton argued that an independent check from doctors should be carried out whenever there are concerns a player may have a head injury before they get the green light to play on and believes that concussion substitutes could be the solution. But the former Celtic forward got irritated with Owen when the ex-Liverpool and Real Madrid striker compared head knocks to leg injuries. Sutton said, until IFAB step up and change the concussion protocols, then they are not looking after player welfare. Player welfare isn't put first within the game, 
We saw the horrible incident at the weekend with Leeds United defender Robin Koch who carried on playing after a serious head injury. Football doesn't care and it needs to start caring. Owen asked what change needed to be made with Sutton replying, what needs to be different? Well, he needs to come off the pitch and go to the sanctuary of the dressing room and get checked by an independent doctor. In the meantime, you have a temporary substitution who can go on and take his place. So numerically, you are not disadvantaged. If the player is okay, he can come back on. It's common sense. Why aren't IFAB stepping up? Owen then provoked Sutton as he said, because bumps and bangs on the head before being cut off by the Celtic fan favourite. Sutton shot back, Hong, hang on a minute, concussion is a bump and a bang. How do you know that? The players are rolling around on the floor. How do you know that's not a concussion? Owen replied, okay, so if you take yours to the extreme, you're breaking a leg every time they roll around holding their leg. If we had your way, they'd be coming off every two minutes. Sutton said, Michael, that's the view of a caveman. Football needs to change. Report by James Kearney. Evening Times Sport, February 24. UEFA prepares to take Champions League final away from St. Petersburg. Report by John McGill. Contingency plans are being drawn up by UEFA over where to host the season's Champions League final, the PA news agency understands. The 68,000 capacity Gazprom Arena in St. Petersburg had been awarded the chance to host Europe's showpiece event, but events overnight look likely to force a change of venue. Russia President Vladimir Putin instructed an attack on Ukraine with explosions heard in the capital Kiev while blasts were also reported in the cities of Odessa and Kharkiv. UEFA is monitoring the situation with the Russian city set to be stripped of hosting the final which is scheduled to take place on May 28. Football supporters Europe have called for an imminent announcement over arrangements for the showpiece in three months' time. A statement on Twitter from them said, On this tragic day, our thoughts are with everyone in Ukraine, our friends, colleagues, members and their loved ones. Given the events unfolding, we expect an imminent announcement from UEFA on the relocation of the Champions League final from St. Petersburg. After changing the venue for the final for the 2020 and 2021 editions due to the coronavirus pandemic, European football's governing body could be forced into a further switch but may wait until the latter stages of the competition to see which sides remain in the tournament. If another All English final was to occur, like last year's between Chelsea and Manchester City, there would be pressure to host it in the UK, but two major stadiums are already out of bounds. Wembley is set to host the Skybet Championship playoff final on May 28, while the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium is primed to host the Rugby League's Betfred Challenge Cup final on the same day. It may open the door to another venue in England's capital, West Ham's London Stadium, which would have space in its summer schedule. London Stadium Chief Executive Graeme Gilmour told the Daily Telegraph, We have a great history of putting on world-class events, from Major League Baseball to sold-out concerts, and of course Premier League matches. We are always happy to hear from event holders and there is a clear track record of the stadium and London hosting the biggest events brilliantly. Holders Chelsea, owned by Russian billionaire Roman Abramovich, Liverpool, Manchester City 
and Manchester United are all in the last 16 of the Champions League. Prime Minister Johnson earlier this week told the House of Commons, a Russia that has pariah status, no chance of holding football tournaments in a Russia that invades southern countries. The Ukraine Premier League was set to end its winter break on Saturday, but a suspension of the division has occurred following Russia's attack. Football in the country stopped on December 13 and will remain paused, which could have a knock-on effect for preparations for next month's World Cup qualifier with Scotland in Glasgow on March 24. A statement from the Ukraine Premier League read, Due to the imposition of martial law in Ukraine, the Championship of Ukraine has been suspended. Report by John McGill Evening Time Sport, February 25 Callum McGregor admits Celtic got what they deserved after disappointed showings. Report by Graham McGarry Callum McGregor has admitted that Celtic simply did not deserve to win their UEFA Conference League tie against Bodo Glimt as the Norwegians eventually ran out 5-1 winners on aggregate. The Celtic captain was left out of the starting lineup in Norway as Ange Postecoglou's men attempted to overturn the 3-1 deficit from last week's first leg in Glasgow but could do nothing to alter the direction of the second leg when he came on at half-time as Celtic eventually fell to a 2-0 defeat on the night. McGregor admitted that over the two legs, Celtic did not get close to the levels they want to perform at and ultimately got what they deserved as their European adventure came to an end for another season. Said McGregor, it was difficult conditions on a difficult pitch against a good side. You are 2 nothing down from the first leg, so it's never going to be an easy task. We didn't start the game well at all, to be honest, and we gave the impetus. It was difficult to recover from that point. We had a bit of a go in the second half, and we had the chance with Days and Maida to get back in it. But over the two legs, we have to accept that we didn't play anywhere near the level we are capable of or have been so far this season. The reality is that we didn't play well enough. You can talk about having the ball, controlling the game and creating chances, but at this level you have to take them. Whenever you don't do that, you always give the opposition a chance. Over the two legs, Bodo showed their quality when they got their moments. Report by Graham McGarry Evening Time Sport, February 25 Dortmund boss Marco Rose makes Rangers admission. Report by Chris Jack Marco Rose admits Rangers were worthy winners as they conquered the Borussia Dortmund to progress to the last 16 of the Europa League. Van Bronckhorst's side followed up their 4-2 victory in Germany last week with a 2-2 draw at Ibrox as James Taverny netted twice. Dortmund were one of the favourites to win the competition this term, but Rose had no complaints over the two legs. He said, We started well in the first half and caused Rangers problems. After conceding a penalty, we continued to play well. As expected, Rangers changed to a 3-5-2 in the second half and that made it quite difficult for us. Our team tried everything, but over the course of two legs, if you concede six goals, you don't deserve to go through. Rangers deserve to win the tie. Report by Chris Jack Evening Times Sport, February 25 Owen Hargreaves continues Rangers' swoon as he admits Europe will be taking notice. Report by Stuart Wilson 
Pundit Owen Hargreaves reckons Rangers have put Europe on red alert after dumping favourites Borussia Dortmund out of the Europa League. The former Manchester United and Bayern Munich man made headlines after the first leg when he compared Ryan Kent favourably to France legend Frank Ribéry. And Hargreaves has been impressed with the Ibrox men's brilliant performance against the Bundesliga giants, saluting it as a pivotal moment for Scottish football that an entire continent will be aware of. Hargreaves told BT Sport, I think the rest of Europe will be taking notice. Absolutely. The amount of goals they score, the way they play, and Ibrox is not a place other teams will want to go and play at. Ibrox is a stadium like Anfield. It can grab a hold of the game, and if the players match that intensity, then it's a very difficult place. They're not one of the favourites on paper, but the way they're performing, they'll believe they can make more noise in the competition. To knock out a team like Borussia Dortmund is some achievement. They were brilliant over the two legs. After two years of COVID, this is what players and fans dream of, playing in front of a crowd like that. It's such a beautiful feeling to win a game against the favourites. It was a huge moment for Glasgow Rangers and for Scottish football. Report by Stuart Wilson Evening Time Sport, February 23rd Ali McCoy's furious Rangers reaction as he lashes out at the referee. Report by Aidan Smith Ali McCoyst was left furious after Rangers were denied a third goal of the evening against Borussia Dortmund following a controversial VAR call. Striker Alfredo Morelos was adjudged to have fouled Mats Hummels before he raced in on goal to set up Ryan Kent. Referee Mato Lajos cancelled out the goal after watching the incident back on the Ibrox VAR monitor, but McCoy could not believe the decision. He told BT Sport, Diabolical decision. Absolutely diabolical. He puts his foot in front of Morellas. There's no contact from him. It's a scandalous decision. Meanwhile, Giovanni Van Bronckhorst praised Rangers' perfect mentality after they battled past Borussia Dortmund and into the Europa League last 16 with a dramatic 6-4 aggregate win. Leading 4-2 from the first leg in Dortmund, skipper James Tavarney scored from the spot in the 22nd minute, but goals from England international Jude Bellingham and striker Daniel Milan had the Bundesliga visitors ahead at the interval. The Dutchman brought on Leon Balogan for Borna Berisic and went to a back three for the second half. And in a more composed performance, Tavarni restored parity in the 57th minute and the 2-2 draw result in one of the finest European outcomes in the club's history. Awaiting the draw on Friday, Van Bronckhorst said, You start with belief. Of course we have huge respect for the opposition, because they are a big team. They play in the Champions League finals and challenge for German titles, so we knew it was going to be difficult. There are always moments in games when you have to dig deep and make sure you overcome these moments. We had them last week and they, we had them today, but we reacted really well. Also the switch of system, but I think our mentality today was perfect and the spirit we showed was fantastic. And my message before the game was that this is a night when we could make everyone proud, involved with this beautiful club, and we did. Report by Aidan Smith Evening Time Sport, February 25 Rangers find their Europa League last 16 opponents. Report by Ewan Payton 
The Rangers will play Carvina Zvezda in the last 16 of the Europa League, otherwise known as Red Star Belgrade. The Serbian Giants provide the next test for Giovanni van Bronckhurst men on the European stage. The draw for the knockout round took place at 11am at the House of European Football in Nyon, Switzerland. The Europa League group winners were seeded for the draw and they were drawn against the winners of the knockout round playoffs. This meant that Rangers had the potential of facing any of Eintracht Frankfurt, Monaco, West Ham, Carvina Zvezda, Galatasaray, Bayer Leverkusen, Lyon or Spartak Moscow. This also meant that Rangers avoided a sensational two-leg tie against Barcelona, with the Spanish giants having dropped down from the Champions League earlier in the season. But Red Star were the name drawn from the hat for the Scottish champions. The first leg tie will be held at Ibrox, with the competition's group winners getting home advantage for the return leg. The ties will take place on Thursday, March 10 and Thursday, March 17. Report by Ewan Payton. Evening Times Sport, February 25. Ryan Jack details drive and doubts after savouring Rangers win over Dortmund. Report by Chris Jack. Ryan Jack has detailed the drive that helped him overcome his fitness doubts after turning around his Rangers career. The midfielder spent almost a year out of action with a long-standing injury as he missed the final stages of the 55 winning campaign last term and the start of the title defence. Jack was also a real miss for Scotland as he had to watch on during the European Championships this summer. But he has now put his injury issues behind him and come to the fore once again at Ibrox as a key part of Giovanni van Bronckhorst's side. Jack was a huge figure during both legs of the Europa League victory over Borussia Dortmund and savoured the moment as progression was secured last night. Said Jack, it means the world to me. Though the whole process the club has been tremendous with me, supporting me through everything I've been through and my operations, my bad news, my good news. They have been to appointments up and down the country with me. The club has stood by me and now it's my chance to repay that. You've always got doubts. That's human nature. Sometimes there are days when you are fighting yourself and doubting yourself. But I am one of those people who will never give up. If there is something that I want badly, I will give it everything. And that's what I've done over the past few months. Recovery for me is vital. That's something I've picked up on over the past six or seven months. When the squad has days off, maybe I will have to sacrifice that and go in as I have been doing. I've been in doing recovery stuff, ice baths, extra stuff in the gym. I have been out for a long time, so it's important I keep myself right and available. Report by Chris Jack. Evening Time Sport, February 25. Van Bronckhorst details a big moment for Rangers after triumph over Borussia Dortmund. Report by Chris Jack. Giovanni van Bronckhurst hailed a big moment for Rangers after seeing his side overcome Borussia Dortmund at Ibrox. The champions booked their place in the last 16 of the Europa League as a 2-2 draw saw them secure a 6-4 aggregate win against the German giants. James Tavarney dented twice at Ibrox, as goals from Jude Bellingham and Daniel Malin were ultimately not enough for Dortmund. Van Bronckhorst switched to a back three for the second half 
as Leon Balogan replaced Borna Barisic and John Lundstrom dropped back into defence. And the tactical call proved to be decisive in the end on a night where Rangers were unfortunate not to emerge victorious over a compelling 90 minutes. Van Bronckhorst said, It is very important for everyone. I spoke to the players and I told them this is a big moment for the club. It was difficult. We got a good start, but then we lost two goals. At half time, I had to change the system. It was a system we trained with and talked about, and it worked well for us in the second half. At home, you don't want to be defending. You want a good start, and we got that. We were unfortunate with the two goals. We could have cleared the ball. There was deflection. I knew I had to change things at half time to get a balance between defending and the transition. It was a purely tactical decision to replace Barisic. We trained with three different plans for today, and this was plan C. We needed it. I knew beforehand we had to have the scenarios in place that had to be ready to be executed, and the guys did really good. To be playing Dortmund twice, and to get a win away and a draw at home, is a very good performance. We are really happy to be going to the next round. The last 16 is only top teams left. We are just really happy to be one of them. Now we'll wait for the draw. Report by Chris Jack. Evening Time Sport, February 25. YouTuber goes gaga for Rangers Atmosphere. Report by Aidan Smith. For those lucky enough to be inside Ibrooks last night, the noise must have been incredible as Rangers toppled Borussia Dortmund in the Europa League. Van Bronckhorst's team defeated the German giant 6-4 on aggregate across the two legs to book their place in the last 16. YouTuber Ellis Platten, who runs the Away Days channel, captured last night's incredible atmosphere from the Dortmund end and he hailed the noise as insane. Footage shows the eyebrow stands shaking as supporters do the bouncy after both of James Tavernier's goals. Meanwhile, Ryan Jack believes Rangers' stunning 6-4 aggregate win will make a lot of people sit up and take notice. Leading 4-2 from the first leg in Germany, James Tavernier scored from the spot in the 26th minute to extend that lead but goals from England international Jude Bellingham and Daniel Milan had the Bundesliga giants ahead at the interval. But Tavarni levelled in the 57th minute and the light blue saw the game out for the 2-2 draw, which takes them into the last 16. Rangers midfielder Jack described the atmosphere as probably the best I played in in my career and said of Rangers' unlikely progression, I think it will be noticed. A lot of people would have predicted Borussia Dortmund going through, and when that's not happened, a lot of people will sit up and take notice. It is a huge result for us. If we get that sort of performance and atmosphere and support at Ibrox, there won't be many who want to come and face us. But there is top quality still in the competition. Whoever we get, we will take it and try to get through that one as well. We knew Dortmund are a huge team and we knew it was going to be tough. But after the first leg, we said we would have to leave everything on the pitch over the two ties and see where it got us. Thankfully, it got us through. We were under the cosh for a lot of the match and Dortmund have got top players and they are a top team but our spirit and togetherness got us through in the end. Report by Aidan Smith Evening Times Sport February 28 
Callum McGregor urges calm at Celtic. Report by Graham McGarry. Callum McGregor has appealed for calm after Celtic dropped points against Hibs, saying the players have to continue to trust Ange Postecoglou's process. The Celtic captain is adamant that his side deserved more from the goalless draw at Easter Road, but with Rangers also drawing with Motherwell at Ibrox and their title fate still in their hands, McGregor says there is no need for panic. And he believes that if they continue to focus on themselves, then they will get the wins required to stay at the top of the Premiership. Said McGregor, you can control what's inside your building. If you start looking elsewhere, that's maybe where the pressure comes. We can only concentrate on our training and matches. Individually, we have to perform. Whether you are six points behind, three points in front, or one point in front, or whatever, it doesn't make a difference. Everyone plays the same amount of games come the end of the season, so the chances will tell you if you win the majority of your games, you'll win the league. That's all we can focus on, not any other result, someone doing us a favour, anything like that. It's purely down to what we do. The group has done ever so well to get us into this position. A lot of new players, young team, new team who have done so well to get to this point. So we will have to stay calm and trust each other, trust the process and what the manager is asking us to do. I think there was enough in the game, chances, possession control, we limited them to very little in the game as well. Sometimes in football, it has a funny way that you don't get what you deserve out of a game. So we have to accept that and accept the result is not what we wanted. But if we produce performances like that and chances like that over the piece, we will do enough. Report by Graham McGarry Evening Times Sport, February 28. Postecoglou lauds his Celtic players despite draw. Report by Matthew Lindsay. Ange Postecoglou has defended Celtic's performance in the goalless draw against Hibs at Easter Road that prevented the Singe Premiership leaders from going five points clear of Rangers. The Parkhead club dominated the league encounter in Leith, but they were unable to convert any of their scoring chances and saw their eight-game winning run in the top flight come to an end as a result. Postecoglou's side gave Van Bronckhorst's team, who took on Motherwell at Ibrox in the later kickoff, the chance to move to within a point of them in the table. However, the Scottish champions were held to a 2-2 draw after conceding two second-half goals and remained three points adrift with ten Premiership games remaining in the 2021-22 campaign. The Celtic manager stressed he was satisfied with how his charges had acquitted themselves during the 90 minutes and insisted all their display was lacking was a goal. Said Postecoglou, it was a good performance. We dominated the game. We played it on our terms, but obviously we did not get our rewards and didn't get the goal we needed. But in terms of the performance, I thought the players, at a difficult venue, on a difficult pitch, with the opposition sitting deep for the most part, was good. It's hard when the opposition sits so deep. There are so many bodies in the box to try and find ways through. There were a couple of times when the ball just didn't bounce our way in critical areas, but I thought the players' efforts were excellent. Asked what had prevented Celtic from triumphing, Postecoglou said, A goal. 
It wasn't through a want of trying. Football is a challenging game when the opposition set up like that. It is not the easiest way to get a goal. And that was all that was missing. Did they create a chance? Really? You are coming away from home against a team that sits deep. The performance was fine. We played our football, played on our terms. It's not like we weren't getting into the right areas or getting balls into the right areas. We hit a couple of shots from good areas that went over the bar that on another day might have gone in. But that's easy for me to say. When there are so many bodies in the box, you are looking for a bit extra from your players. From my perspective, you come to these places and you want to try and play your own football. It doesn't always happen, but I thought today it did. Asked by one reporter, Celtic had lacked a spark. Postecoglou tapped his microphone and said, is this working? You've got to understand football is not played in perfect isolated conditions. You're talking about an opposition whose main role is to try and stop you, a pitch that is not conducive to moving the ball quickly. Within that, the players were still brave. They were still passing into the right areas. We still got into the right areas. I get it. We didn't win. The world has collapsed. I understand that. We'll manage that the next couple of days. But from my perspective, when you come away from home and you dominate an opposition at what is traditionally a tough venue and you don't get the win, you're disappointed because I think our play deserved it. Report by Matthew Lindsay Evening Time Sport, February 28. Rugby, Gregor Townsend laments Scotland's failure to take opportunities. Report by Stuart Baskate. Textbook improvisation. It may sound like a contradiction in terms, but that was what France produced at BT Murrayfield on Saturday as they beat Scotland 36-17 in the process enhancing their status as firm favourites for the Six Nations Championship and ending the home team's hopes of a tilt at the title. At their best, Scotland can conjure up moments of brilliance, but nothing like the sustained excellence that the French achieved in this sixth tri triumph. And while it is legitimate to accept that this France team are simply superior to their rivals, at least in some respects. The concerning thing from a Scots point of view is that Gregor Townsend's side have not been anywhere near their best in their three games so far. Indeed, judging by the score in this game, they are further away from it than they have been at any point this season. The head coach accepted afterwards that the margin of defeat had been galling, but suggested it had been partly caused by the need to chase the game in a second half, which had barely begun when France scored their fourth try to take a 16-point lead. Townsend's overall conclusion, however, was that the scale of the loss was at most a secondary concern. He said, over the last couple of years, we've won games or lost them by close margins. It's disappointing to lose it by more. To be honest, whether we lost it by a point or by 20 points, it doesn't change things too much. Our goal is to win the game. And to win the game, we must take our opportunities when you get them. And when you do it, it becomes a different game. The opposition have to do something different. We didn't get our opportunities and France got tries either side of half time. That made it a very hard game to win. The scoreline is probably extended as we were chasing things in that second half, chasing it from too deep at times. 
I'm not too worried about how the scoreline got away from us. It's more making sure we can work our way towards winning games. Scotland did precisely that against England, but failed agonisingly to do the same against Wales. And although they might well have scored a couple more tries on Saturday, to add to the two that did count, their opponents always looked capable of scoring again when it mattered. If Paul Willems's opening try was the product of individual brilliance from Antoine Dupont, Yoram Moafana's second was the perfect summation of the whole team's approach as loosehead Cyril Bale displayed the artistry not often associated with his position in offloading cutely to the try scorer. Finn Russell got Scotland off the mark with a penalty between those two scores and converted the deputant Rory Darge's try after half an hour to close the gap to 10-12. But Gail Ficou's try in time added on, and then Jonathan Dante's two minutes after the restart reaffirmed French dominance. A Damien Penault double then followed, as Scotland appeared increasingly bereft of ideas. And while Duan van der Merwe had the last word, after an excellent break by substitute Blair Kinghorn, it was far too little, far too late. Scotland can still emulate their achievements of the last two seasons and end up with three victories from five matches. But to do that, they will have to win first in Rome and then in Dublin. If they manage the first match in style, they will head for Ireland with realistic hopes of ending their campaign with back-to-back -back victories. But the priority before they play again will surely be how to handle the despondency provoked by this defeat, which is threatening to turn yet another six nations into one which began with great promise, only to end in an all-too-familiar feeling of deflation. Townsend added, We go into every championship with aspirations of winning each game we play and being in the mix going into the last two weeks. Despite the result in Cardiff, we still had an opportunity against France to be in the mix if we had won, but we didn't. It's over to other teams to challenge for that title now. We know it's a huge tournament, the Six Nations, and we have two important games to improve and show what we're capable of. But it is disappointing that we won't be involved in any title race as the tournament goes into the last fortnight. We know we have to put our best team out and put on our best performance to win in Italy. They will be hugely motivated by our scoreline and France getting tries from our errors. We'll have to play a lot better next week to win that game. Report by Stuart Bathgate Evening Time Sport, February 28 Scottish FA boycott upcoming Russia fixtures as they send support to Ukraine. Report by Aidan Smith the Scottish Football Association have confirmed that Scotland will not play any fixtures against Russia for the foreseeable future at all levels. A statement followed announcements by the Football Associations of England, Wales, Poland, Sweden and the Czech Republic that they will refuse to play Russia at any venue. The SFA also extended its support to Ukraine and offered to help their colleagues and national teams prepare for upcoming matches against Scotland at men's and women's levels. The statement read, The Scottish FA President Rod Petrie has written to his counterpart at the Ukrainian Association of Football to send a message of support, friendship and unity. 
Football is inconsequential amid conflict, but we have conveyed the strong sense of solidarity communicated to us by Scotland fans and citizens in recent days. We remain in dialogue with UEFA and FIFA regarding our men's FIFA World Cup playoff and women's World Cup qualifier and have offered to support our Ukrainian colleagues' preparations as best we can in these unimaginably difficult circumstances. Should the current circumstances continue, we will not sanction the nomination of a team to participate in our scheduled UEFA Regions Cup fixture against Russia due to be played in August. This will remain our position should any other fixtures arise at any level of international football. Report by Aidan Smith Evening Time Sport, February 28 Van Bronckhorst addresses McGregor's Rangers form and position. Report by Chris Jack Giovanni Van Bronckhorst insists it would be wrong to point the finger of blame at keeper Alan McGregor in the wake of Rangers' latest Premiership stumble at Ibrox. The champions saw their title chances suffer another blow yesterday, as Motherwell came from two goals down to earn a share of the points and stun Van Bronckhorst's side on home soil. Rangers saw a comfortable lead earned thanks to a Bevis Mugabe own goal and Fashion Sakala strike at the break, cancelled out by Jordan Roberts and Kane Woolery. Roberts would convert from close range after McGregor and Connor Goldson failed to deal with a low cross from Woolery as he burst down the right flank early in the second half. And it was the former Tranmere forward that completed the comeback with 15 minutes remaining, as Goldson and James Tavernier were brushed off too easily, and McGregor was somehow beaten at his near post. The form of the veteran keeper has come under scrutiny from supporters in recent weeks, but McGregor retains the full backing of his Ibrox boss said Van Bronckhorst, if we get a goal against us, it is not only Alan McGregor, it is very easy to say it is the fault of the goalkeeper. In the build-up we didn't do tactically well, we passed to players we never passed to when we are building up in this way. It starts with the build-up, I think we defend as a team. As I said before, I think Alan is a good goalkeeper, a very experienced one. It is very easy to put the blame on him because we conceded two goals. Report by Chris Jack. And that was this week's Glasgow Times Sport podcast, normally recorded in our studio at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre, currently recorded from our volunteers' homes with the publisher's kind permission. Thanks for listening. <laughs>